Hey everybody, how's it going? Hope you're having a lovely morning. So today I'd like to discuss a article that was written and posted in my Discord about things that don't last as long as they used to and how this is a romanticized notion when we talk about how things used to last longer or be made to last and now they're not. There are certain elements of this article I agree with and there are other elements of this article that I disagree with so I thought we could turn it into a bit of a discussion here and thank you to the gentleman who posted this to the Discord. So this here is talking about old stoves. This is from rootsofprogress.org. They don't make them like they used to. Old stoves may last 100 years, but modern ones are better. Recently, someone on Twitter posted a picture like this, commenting that this type of stove will work after 100 years, but thanks to progress and improvement, you have to replace your stove with a new one after 5 years. Of course, durability is not the only attribute that matters. A stove like this burns wood or coal, that fuel needs to be hauled into the house and up the steps of a tenement, and the ash is carried out. Solid fuel, unlike natural gas, also generates smoke. If all is in proper order, the chimney carries the smoke away so it merely pollutes your neighborhood. If not, the smoke could leak into your home, causing a major health hazard to both the lungs and the eyes. Note also a few missing features. An on-off control. This kind of stove, which is only one step advanced beyond an open hearth fireplace, requires that you build a fire yourself. A temperature dial. You build a fire and you get what you get. A skilled cook can vary the temperature by moving the pots various distances from the firebox, but basically good luck following a recipe. Self-cleaning mode, or for that matter, any enamel or other protective coating. Cast iron stoves need to be cleaned daily and waxed regularly, or they will rust and wear out. So for most people, the convenience, cleanliness, and safety of a modern stove far outweigh its shorter lifespan, which incidentally is not 5 years, but 13 to 15, according to Consumer Reports. In other words, yes, modern stoves do represent progress and an improvement, no scare quotes required. The advantages of gas slash electricity in particular also outweigh the downside of risking an interruption in these services. An example of Matt Ridley's observation of how he moved from precarious self-sufficiency to safer mutual interdependence. But why can't a modern stove last 100 years? I don't know the technical answer. The electrical connections needed for the temperature control are sensitive, presumably. Probably the walls and door are thinner, using less material for cost and efficiency versus thick, heavy cast iron. Um, one thing that I find interesting here is saying, I don't know why it can't last that long, but I'm not going to try and figure out why they don't last. I'm just going to say that it's better that they be designed in this more economical way which I don't 100% disagree with, but I will say I 50% disagree with. But I think I know the economic answer, which is a modern stove designed and built to last 100 years would be too expensive. It would be a bigger engineering effort, fixed cost, and probably more or better materials. Variable cost. And it's totally unnecessary. While there is something quaint and romantic about very long-lived items, there's just no real reason a consumer needs them. So no one would pay for the 100-year stove, and even if somebody made it, it would fail in the marketplace. A mid-tier range costs $1,500. Amortized over that 15-year life, that's just $100 a year, which is very affordable. Besides, by upgrading every decade or two, consumers get the latest features. Why build a stove to last 100 years if it's going to be obsolete long before then? I, I want my stove to heat my food. <laughs> like, I, don't, I don't care. If, I, please, for the love of God, do not ever give me a stove that connects to the internet. Anyway. A few people might nonetheless prefer old stoves, and all of us might occasionally enjoy cooking over an open flame on a charcoal grill, but the vast majority of consumers have voted with their wallets to make the old style of stove into an antique. Some lessons here. Evaluate products as a function of all attributes, including convenience and cost, not just one attribute taken in isolation. Be careful of romanticizing obsolete technology. Usually we moved on for a reason. The ideal is not a static state where everything lasts forever and nothing changes. Such a world is impossible and undesirable. Even if we could create it, it would be stagnant. The ideal is a dynamic world of progress, of continuous Continual upgrading and renewal. So the area where I disagree here is where we're talking in terms of uh, these absolutes. This concept that disposable electronics breaks, so you have to buy a new one, are good actually, as the gentleman in Discord says. We don't have a static a state where everything lasts forever and nothing changes, but I don't think that that's what people are asking for when they're referring to the fact that it seems like certain products that are more modern tend to be made in a manner where they're just fundamentally disposable. Whether it's because they don't have any parts available when you want to repair it, whether it's because repair manuals are not made available even to professional and licensed repair shops or because sometimes they're simply made like crap. And the other thing that I disagree with is the idea that consumers are always voting with their wallets. Obviously, people would prefer a stove that has an on-off switch and a temperature control to a stove that does not have an on-off switch that does not have temperature control. That is obvious. But when we're talking about how long a product is made to last, I don't think that consumers are particularly wait, uh, voting with their wallets. I'll give you one example. When we talk about something like, let's say, one of these newer 
MacBook Pros. Whereas you could see right now, the MacBook Pro is open maybe about 30 degrees, and you can see that there is a light on the screen. But then as I open the machine further, you see that the light goes out and now there is nothing on the screen. The reason that happens is because they have a cable that is too short on the display assembly. On this one, you see on the left, and they made it, I mean, on the right, and on the left, you can see they made the cable a little bit longer, and Paul goes over that in this video, where he shows you he's uh, like kind of moving it back and forth, and you can see that there is a bend over there. Now, again, this is something that wasn't an issue to this extent. You've always had video cables that fail, but not in this guaranteed 100% failure kind of way. Uh, this, this is not the type of thing where consumers are voting with their wallets because when you purchase the product, it does not say in the brochure, by the way, the flex cable is too short. So when you use the device in its intended way, doing this, you are actually doing serious physical damage and harm to it. When you buy, let's say, I don't know, let's say you buy a stove and it has an issue with one particular switch that fails after two or three years, I'm pretty sure that it doesn't say in the brochure, by the way, this stove, unlike the stove that's right next to it in the store, is most likely going to die in two to three years, and that's why it costs $8 less than this other stove. I don't think consumers have that ability to vote with their wallets because this is just fundamentally not something that's advertised. When we're talking about the quality of the contacts, the quality of the switches, the quality of the solder joints, the quality of the engineering, that's usually not the stuff that is in the brochure, nor is it something that you can easily compare side by side with one device versus another. This is something that you get to figure out after you've already paid for it and after you've spent a good amount of time and money, of, you know, let's say after you've used it for one or two years, now people start to figure out how it's designed. But by then, that model is no longer in the store. So the concept that when it comes to durability and longevity that we're voting with our wallets, I do want to provide a little bit of pushback there because I don't think that's the case. Whether we're talking about a camcorder, whether we're talking about a laptop, or whether we are talking about home appliances and stoves. And further, the idea, again, when it comes to appliance repair, you'll notice that, you know, AHAM is frequently uh, lobbying against many of these right to repair bills. Why? Because the appliance repair people often have a lot of the same problems that we do, where they want to be able to buy a part, they want to be able to get access to a schematic or a diagram or a manual so that they could fix your appliances, and they are not able to. 100 years ago, our technology may have been massively shittier than the technology that we have today. However, this was not a part of our culture. And this is a big part of what we're talking about here when we talk about how things used to be repairable. I am not asking cell phones to be designed with an antenna that pulls out where if you're standing under a tree, you don't get service the way it was 30 or 40 years ago. That being said, when you look at the manual that you get when you buy an Altair computer, and then you look at the manual that you get for a MacBook, I mean, I'm not asking computers to be Altairs, but it would be nice if that philosophy of providing things that allow you to repair would still continue to exist. This is not some sort of all or nothing binary where you're either dealing with a 100 year old stove that's gonna rust easy, that has no temperature controls and no on button that can poison everybody around you, or you're getting a modern stove that only lasts a couple of years. There really is a middle ground there, and I think that that's what a lot of people are looking for. And now you may have people that are a little bit extremist with it that will actually romanticize the 100 year old device and can forget everything else that's wrong with it. But that's not really uh, something that I think is real. It is really what people are clamoring for. And when it comes to things that are being designed to not last, I think it's very important to remember things like the Phoebus cartel. This was an oligopoly. Uh, it's probably froze there for a second. This was an oligopoly that controlled the manufacture and sale of incandescent light bulbs. They appropriated market territories and lowered the useful life of such bulbs. Corporations based in Europe and America founded the cartel in January 15, 1925 in Geneva. Phoebus based itself in Switzerland. The corporation aimed a. They had intended the cartel to last for 30 years. The cartel ceased operations in 1939 owing to the outbreak of World War II. And what they did is they set a specific, you know, the, the, the light bulbs that were being produced were lasting too long. And if the light bulb that you produce lasts too long, then people are not going to be replacing it. So they specifically worked to lower the, um, the length that the light bulb would last and then up the price of those bulbs so that people would have to continuously buy new bulbs. Uh, this, this is a thing. This is a thing that has actually happened in the past, and it is, for all we know, something that could be happening now. Now, I don't specifically believe that when something like this happens that this is being done on purpose. I think that this is just stupidity and engineering. But again, I don't think it's that much to ask that a device that we pay one or two or $3,000 for be designed a little bit more like the one on the left 
rather than the one on the right, but more importantly, that when these problems are demonstrated, when these problems are released to the world, that we be able to get access to what it is we need to be able to do our job, whether you are a laptop repair person, an automotive mechanic, or an appliance repair person. And you know, one of the things that I think is really important when we're talking about the nostalgia for the past, or the nostalgia for what, how things were 100 years ago, did you have an organization like AHAM lobbying against the ability to get access to a service manual for a stove 100 years ago? Think about it, because you'll see. I think one of the lobbyists that showed up in Nebraska and, and Boston and many others, uh, I'm trying, I forget her name, uh, Sarah Faye Pierce, I think that was the name, uh, from AHAM. You know, I'm not making this up. You can find all of these videos on my channel, and it's not sim we're not just simply talking about the functionality and features of old devices. We are also talking about the mindset that used to exist. A hundred years ago, the idea that a company would lobby against your ability to repair what you own was insane. And now it's considered a standard, and we even have people that will fight and argue to defend it. Remember, 100-year-old thing that's made to last 100 years, that's expensive and will poison you and has no features, modern device with features and functionality that breaks in a few years, there is a middle ground there. And the reason we don't have it is not because consumers have voted with their wallets, but rather because consumers don't really even have the information to be able to do so. And what I'm trying to do with this YouTube channel is I'm trying to slowly inculcate this back into the culture again to where people actually ask questions about repairability and the durability of what it is they're purchasing and they actually value this again because they understand that it's being taken away from them. That's what I want them to understand because I don't believe a lot of people really do understand how this is being taken away from them. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. That's it for today. And as always, I hope you learned something. I'll see you all in the next video and uh, bye now.